The beginning of a story is its most valuable asset. It acts as both the story's foundation and its hook, establishing a mutual trust between the creator and their audience. The creator promises to lead the audience through a story that will be worth their time. Helga! If a writer fails their beginning, it is difficult to salvage the remainder of the story. Now, they must grow something meaningful from a poor foundation, while also attempting to regain the attention and trust of disengaged viewers. That being the case, the beginning of a story is also the most difficult part to write. If anyone watching this is an artist, they'll know the feeling of staring at a blank page and not knowing where to begin. This video being persuasive writing in itself, I'm experiencing that struggle right now. Stories, in a sense, are a form of persuasive writing. Every element of the story, every scene, every character is a piece of evidence and is used to convince the reader, viewer, or player of the story's substance. That substance being a message which gives purpose to the piece of art. A message is something every artist, doubtless, wants to communicate. It creates a story's framework, directing every aspect of the piece toward one single goal, persuading the audience to ponder the core message presented. Artists are people who are inspired to create the unreal to influence or portray something real. Therein lies a desire to change the world through sharing a perspective they think is valuable. It may sound self-righteous, but that's what art was created to do since the dawn of its existence, to influence. Though art may not change who people fundamentally are, it's often a catalyst toward introspection, which frames the reader's life in ways they may not yet have considered, provoking small change in the process. The key to bringing about introspection is the artist's multifaceted understanding of the message they're presenting. To achieve this, the artist must, at times, put themselves in the perspective of something they may disagree with. They have to accurately depict conflicting arguments in order to provide a counter to them. Sometimes, that may shift the artist's outlook. The art can help even the artist grow when it takes on a fabricated life of its own. The world in which a story takes place and all of the world's facets is a subsection of that piece of artwork's meaning and essential in creating quote unquote synthetic life. Be it with characters, character development, plot progression, tone, a good story will not squander any of the resources it creates to substantiate itself. The world must achieve two things to persuade its consumer. It must be convincing, and it must highlight what the story is trying to say. In tandem, those two elements persuade the audience that what they're intaking makes sense within its own boundaries and that it's relevant to the topic at hand. Whether a piece of writing takes place in our own world or a completely fantasized creation, if it doesn't establish its own rules and operate within them, then both the surface level plot of a story and the underlying message become insubstantial. When the rules of a world are contrived or ignored at the behest of the writer, it's no longer something the audience is compelled to relate to or apply to themselves, and a failure toward the ultimate goal of influence. Identifying the story's purpose will naturally lead to the creation of the world, characters, and plot, through which the audience experiences a new perspective and discovers new ideas. All elements of a story can be naturally crafted toward that end. It begins with that spark of inspiration that every ambitious artist has. The ideal that lights a fire under them and compels them to share that perspective with everyone who cares to consume it. Every element of what a great story does is in the pursuit of influence. Well, we have to talk about the hot sauce. <laughs> Do we have to talk about the hot sauce? Stop! <laughs> it keeps going! Oh, what is that? Whoa! The rest what of was your that cut? <laughs> oh, did I just do a gotcha roll? Who is that? <laughs> is he red? What? He's red! I He's red! Take some sauce. Damn it! Um, stop! That was two more. Did that in death. Hey, you just spoiled the game! I took two hot sauces, ate a cracker. <laughs> Jeez, let me take another one. After finishing Fire Emblem Engage. And she probably still won't be done. <laughs> Suffice to say, I remain thoroughly unconvinced. 
I sound like a bitch. <laughs> when the initial trailers for Engage were revealed, there were certain elements everyone could pinpoint, dissect, and critique based on their own merit isolated from the rest of the game. I went into Engage with very low expectations, but was ready to appreciate elements that were earned. I was prepared for one-note characters with a simple point A to point B story with little to no nuance, as I had been advised to expect. Within the first few minutes, I thought that's what I was being given. Fire Emblem Engage opens with a beautifully rendered cutscene of what looks to be the final battle. It follows the protagonist, Alir, as he fights alongside his allies through waves of enemies, stopping at a chamber that sits at the battlefield's end. Inside, he's met with the game's central antagonist, and the tutorial ensues, following the two opposing forces in what will most certainly be the final battle. By this point, I was feeling somewhat optimistic. I don't know, I'm just gonna try to have fun. I'll just let the game speak for itself, I guess. Yo, is that Ike? Yeah. <laughs> I kind of <laughs> it feels good in your hands. The game felt good in my hands and it dumped me straight into the action where I had no choice but to pay attention. By the time the brief tutorial was over and Alir awoke from his 1000 year slumber into the storyline that would naturally lead to the events I just saw, I was excited to watch the game lead me there, however simple the path may be. However, after devoting the subsequent week to playing Fire Emblem Engage to completion, even I and all my low expectations managed to be surprised. Oh no, I have to say YouTuber things now. It's going to be cringe. Welcome back to the Writer's Almanac. I said I would make this a series, so I guess we're that right now. It's a place to organize my thoughts on stories I've experienced for the sake of expanding my own knowledge and abilities as a writer. With it, I can hopefully inspire a few others to take an in-depth look at these stories with me. At the moment, the reception of Fire Emblem Engage appears relatively positive. Knowing what the conversation surrounding this game looks like, I intend to analyze it entirely by its own merit, removed from the rest of the franchise. There's only only a small number of people going super in depth with the game at the moment, so I figured I would toss my hat in the ring to represent a more critical stance toward Engage by truly ripping open as many aspects of it as I feel I'm qualified to. That being said, I'm going to be as objective as possible, so if a somewhat fresh, long form dissection interests you, I greatly appreciate being heard out. I also want to mention my genuine shock at how well the last video did. When I saw the views ticking up in the three digits, I had to temper my excitement that it could breach 1000. And now it's undecouple that number. I didn't even know what the word for that was until now. I am so unbelievably happy and grateful for all of the support and for your insightful and funny comments such as I thought this was a Miru and I hate Yoi. To support the channel and the creation of more content like this, please consider leaving a like and subscribing. Thank you. Time to ruin my upward momentum. Please go easy on me, Fire Emblem community. I'm a girl, so you have to be nice, okay? I'll start crying. On the continent of Elios, Alir awakens from a 1,000 year slumber. He's apparently a very important person, but he awoke with amnesia, with absolutely no memories. Upon being attacked by creatures known as Corrupted, he's saved by one Queen Lumera, who, in the form of a dragon, swoops in to save him. From her, the player and Alir learn that he is a divine dragon. Aside from Lumera, he's the only other one in existence. That being the case, he has the ability to summon emblems from emblems emblem rings. With two of twelve already in his possession, it's his job to collect the remaining rings from the four kingdoms of Firene, Brodia, Illusia, and Solm in order to defeat the fell dragon Somron, whose goal is world domination. Somron currently dwells in and is supported by Illusia. Most prominently, Lumera tells Alir that he is her child. His ass does not remember her. Soon after arriving at Lumera's castle, they're attacked by a hooded individual and Lumera is killed. Now, after being sent off by his late mother and guide, Alir must begin his journey to collect the emblems. In Firene, Alir fights off the corrupted and Illusian invaders, led by a woman named Zephia, and is given two more of the Twelve Rings as a reward. In Brodia, Alir's growing party is attacked by the younger of two Illusian princesses, Hortensia. There, she reveals that the fell dragon can also summon the emblems, showing off her corrupted emblem. Alir is given a fifth emblem ring from Brodia after defeating Hortensia. 
He then fends off another round of Aleutian invaders who've reached the Brodian castle. This time, the invaders are led by the elder Aleutian princess, Ivy, from whom Alir takes another ring. The Aleutian king, Hyacinth, sends Ivy once again to distract Alir's group, but they spare her and she flees with her retainers. The group then invades the fell dragon's domain. They fight off Hortensia again, who is distraught with the falsified idea that her sister was killed, and then kill King Hyacinth. Upon the appearance of the fell dragon and Vale, however, I just realized I forgot to incorporate Vale into this. Uh, Vale is a girl Alir has bumped into three times. Anyway, it's revealed that she is the fell dragon's daughter and also the hooded individual who killed Lumera. She steals all of the rings Alir's collected so far while he mourns her betrayal. How could you deceive us like this? They retreat to Solm and Ivy joins the player and gives them two new rings. Alir, now joined by Ivy, is given a ring by Solm's queen before fending off yet another round of illusion invaders who breached the castle, this time led by Hortensia. If this is beginning to sound repetitive, I am very much aware. Patience. Although Hortensia is pissed that her sister betrayed her and her father is forever dead, Ivy convinces her to join the cause. They earn yet another ring from this escapade and two others in quick succession after a conflict with the Four Hounds, a group led by Zephia, seen earlier in Firene, who directly serves the Fell Dragon. We follow the Four Hounds as they launch an attack on Firene and are met again with Vale. Remember Floraport 2K23? Apparently, it wasn't a of Vale's own volition that she stole the rings and was creating the corrupted. Rather, she was being mind-controlled by Zephia to do so. Zephia then makes Alir fight the mind-controlled Vale and the hounds out of Firene. When Vale awakens from her evil state, she sneaks two of the hounds' rings to Alir's group as a show of support. This is around the point where the story started to lose me. Approaching the end of their journey, our lovable team of Alfred, oh, Diamant, and Ivy follow the hounds back into Illusia and break into the castle with eight of the 12 rings in tow. Oh my god, I completely forgot about Tamara. It's here that Alir is told he isn't the son of the divine dragon Lumera, but rather the son of the fell dragon Sombron. Cool. They're missing only one ring now, which Sombron, Vale, and Zephia take to Queen Lumera's old castle. Apparently, there's an ancient land that used to be there which sunk into the ocean called Gradlon. Sombron's actual goal is to raise it back out of the water, but then he can do the world domination. The party enters the old castle where they try to reach Vale through an enchanted mind control helmet placed on her. It has Curse of Binding on it. Our heroes fight Vale and then lose all the rings again in the process. With the rings in his possession, Sombron raises Gradlon, opens a portal to other worlds, and kills Alir. But worry not, because Vale breaks free of the helmet and uses her corrupting powers to revive Alir. Alir uses this opportunity to take back the rings that Sombron decided to leave behind, but he begins to die again after summoning them. He's resurrected for a second time in quick succession by being built different. Basically, he becomes an emblem, but he turns back into a normal guy in the next scene. The group now needs to close the portal above Elios because apparently Sombron's actual, actual goal is to go and conquer other worlds. To do that, we need to break three crystals that rose alongside Gradlon. The first one is in a volcano, where they fight the remaining hounds and kill them. Zephia tells Alir that to break the next crystal, they need to go back in time. To amend this, she gives them a crystal that lets them do that. We actually already had one of those, but thanks Zephia, very cool. They go back in time and break that crystal, then return to destroy the last one. They then go to their floating home base and decide that they should levitate the home base up into the portal to reach Sombron. I think they already knew they could do this because otherwise their first thought after Sombron flew away wouldn't be, now we need to break those crystals. It would be, how the hell are we gonna get up there? We go to fight Sombron, who then explains that his actual, actual, actual goal is to find his emblem boyfriend who disappeared, whom he wishes to see again. In the portal, the emblems can't retain their forms and they seem lost again, but Alir summons them anyway. They defeat Sombron, close the portal, and the game is over. Okay, this journey spans the length of about 60 hours. Are you wondering how we got here? Are you confused? Putting the entirety of Engage in perspective, I believe, will leave someone feeling one of two ways, bewildered or entirely neutral. Both of these reactions are reasonable. Your interpretation will hinge on how closely you associate elements of the story with common pitfalls in writing, especially those frequently seen in anime, ranging from the common use of amnesia or mind control as plot devices to 
you, teleports behind you, it was a hologram. These elements instill a feeling of caution in viewers for a reason. While not being inherently flawed themselves, they're often paired with greater issues. Some audience members will naturally stigmatize these things. However, a stigma is still a blanket statement. There have been outliers that properly established forces like these and portrayed them in consistent ways that were enjoyable. The question becomes, according to its most relevant and important plot points, is that wariness warranted in Engage? Well, there are clearly elements of this game that invite scrutiny. Upon examining them, they do indeed reveal issues that are common in the anime medium, but which are also found frequently in other forms of media, just in ways that aren't as telegraphed. The problems aren't inherently dragons and crystals and simple morality, but rather something deeper which those things happen to coincide with often, or in some cases are introduced to hide. Considering many of us, including myself at times, have been at least somewhat desensitized to it, pinpointing what lies beyond these elements and why it's always so destructive to itself is going to be a large undertaking. Shedding a light on these things we've all gotten used to and why they so often harm themselves while also indicating something far more telling and detrimental is what I'm setting out to do. Do you know what this is? A draconic time crystal. Of course! <laughs> of reversing time itself. <laughs> no way! Wow! That can reverse the, ta the time! The consensus you'll find commonly among fans right now is that Engage has a simple story that isn't meant to be taken seriously, which is meant to excuse its incoherence. Setting aside for a moment the fact that the game itself doesn't feel the same, I very readily acknowledge that simple, unserious stories can have value. Working around simplicity while still telling a good story and properly communicating its ideas is an entire art form in itself. It's like the writing equivalent of the minimalism movement. Simplicity doesn't have all the nuances that make a story grand and complex, but it does have the necessary components to communicate its ideas. The difference is in execution. Think Undertale. Undertale divulges information where it's necessary and organically introduces one or two simple concepts that consistently affect the story. It incorporates its deus ex machina determination into the mechanics of the world as well as the theme, building a story that is both satisfying and impactful. Due to the carefully selected information and scenes portrayed, the player is artfully led through a linear story. This is a point A to point B plot with little to no nuance as prescribed. It's broadly enjoyable because it's concise to the point and consequently easy to resonate with. Carelessly categorizing a story as simple in order to excuse its mistakes not only insults the integrity of complex stories that strive to be less fundamentally flawed, it also insults the art of simplicity itself, as well as an audience's ability to perceive. Simplicity is limited but pointed information information for an equally pointed purpose. It's not being forced into a state of required thoughtlessness and disconnect throughout a 60 hour experience, and it's not the expectation that an audience will pick and choose when and when not to re-immerse themselves between scenes that are dull then suddenly exciting, made to simply accept that its climaxes probably make sense without first using all scenes to develop those climaxes. If there's a metaphorical line drawn in the sand between simple and complex, that line doesn't doesn't represent the story making sense. <laughs> All this is to say that there's a way to do whimsy and simplicity, and that is not what makes Engage so ineffective. Rather, it's the fact that simplicity was not the creator's intent at all. It's just the way many have categorized it, because by not reading into the underlying implications or lack of underlying implications in a story, that story would naturally look simple. So if Engage isn't simple, then what is it? What is it about Engage's storytelling? that crosses the threshold into complexity, but fails to communicate it. She's in the back rooms! No! <laughs> is that your outfit impression? Yeah. Was it good? Yeah, it was pretty good. Excuse me from the palace, please. Where's the bathroom? <laughs> Engage is a story that tries to be complex without substantiating those complexities. A glaring indicator of surface level complexity is a story's inability to show and not tell, either because confusing concepts contradict each other or are not fully fleshed out. If there was one universal rule in writing, it would be the show don't tell rule. I'm sure you've heard it at least once. It's the type of lesson that everyone
one will hear and think, yeah, sure, I know that. But I've only recently begun to realize just how astronomical a difference it makes in the pursuit of writing successfully. I find this show-don't-tell formula to be a very helpful judge of quality. It's not a guide that sticks to a literal beat-by-beat -beat standard of subjective plot progression. No, the formula I'm talking about is much more natural. It's how humans perceive things that are presented to them. There's a very infamous quote allegedly by, uh, by Stalin. I promise this is going somewhere. The death of one man is a tragedy. The death of a million is a statistic. It's been said in different ways before him and said in different ways after. And unfortunately, when applied to the context of a large apathetic mass, it has a lot of truth. When humans are exposed to distant tragedies through broad news headlines or hearsay, they experience less empathy than when given, say, an extremely detailed case of an individual person's tragic death. The phenomenon is called compassion fade. It's why in journalism, on-site stories of individuals are very highly valued parts of articles, to humanize the massive numbers and show that each one out of a million has a similar experience. This is also why the show don't tell rule is so universally effective. In the same way, examples and causal effects help writers to convince and invest an audience. The more I analyze and the more I form critiques, the more I notice just how many issues are rooted in the failure of this one concept. One implementation of show don't tell is its applicability to exposition and world building. Communicating information to a viewer through unnatural dialogue or unmemorable long-winded narration will ultimately hurt audience retention. The information often doesn't stick or ultimately feels as though it never actually occurs within the world aside from spoken word. Meaning the best way to introduce information is to show it occurring. But the idea that this is all show don't tell represents is a mis conception that understates its importance. What is perhaps even more detrimental than just long-winded exposition is when information told to the audience is never acknowledged or actively contradicted in events that occur within the story. It makes that information and all subsequent information feel shoddy, untrue, and generally unconvincing. The foundation of the story, how it will progress, and the broader message is shaken as a result. This idea can also be applied to individual concepts, characters, and and growth. If a writer claims a character to be something, but those ideas never impact the story when they aren't expressly necessary, or said character acts contradictory to what the viewer knows about them, it becomes contrived. It's an idea that will be introduced, then factored into a scenario or ignored, depending on what the writers need in that moment. Engage never adheres to the idea of show, don't tell, and instead falls completely into contrivance. This is visible everywhere, in both its world as well as the characters within its world. A convenient example of this and a good place to start is the most prevalent character of them all. In an interview conducted by Nintendo, Engage's development team said this, We had many twists and turns with Nintendo regarding the characterization of Alir. When a protagonist is a royal, they are often associated with bravery, or thought to have a sense of mission to fight against fate and challenges, and I believe those are the traits that people generally associate with heroes. However, I thought, such heroes are unlikely to resonate with people today. Let's say someone tells you one day out of nowhere that your mission is to save the world. My guess is your response wouldn't be like, okay, I'll do my best. So at the early stage of development, we had many moments where Alir fears the enemies and says unheroic things. Well, we overdid it, and Nintendo pointed it out to us. So, we decided to keep a good balance. We kept Alir's fragile side in the beginning, but showed them gradually growing braver. The protagonist, in other words, the actual player of the game, embarking on a journey is a classic storyline of a Fire Emblem title, but we knew we wanted to create a story that matches the modern world and made some adjustments. What a backhanded thing to say. <laughs> Alir and many of the concepts surrounding him are some of the best examples I could give of this game's inability to show and not tell, and subsequently my personal least favorite part of the game, which surprised me because I thought if I was going to like any of the characters it would be him, considering I have to spend the entire game with him. To say my distaste for Alir severely hurt the entire game would be an understatement. So, aside from my personal experience, what is it about Alir that embodies the antithesis of 
show don't tell. First of all, Alir is given little to no room to grow throughout the game. He has no character arc and no decipherable differences between the beginning of the story and the end. Alir will begin his journey mourning the death of his mother and fighting to save others as a deity revered by his allies and end it the same, without any new ideas or morals affecting his actions along the way. However, the writers occasionally pretend there is change. There's supposed to be an aspect of Alir that's cowardly and afraid of the corrupted, but that part of him never actually amounts to anything. The best example of this is right at the beginning of the game, when he and his guardians encounter the corrupted for the first time. To everyone's surprise, he says, No, let's run. Huh? But bravely fights the corrupted anyway, because Clan and Fram were in trouble. If he was well and truly scared, and that was an element of his character that would progress, we would see him fail at least once at being brave, watch the consequences of that negative side of him unfold, then watch him grow from it. Instead, this scene gives the impression that he got over it immediately, but after the intro, he still occasionally tacks on that he is indeed deathly afraid in missable supports and throwaway lines. So when he later talks about some, I'm not afraid anymore, how much they desperately want to force this idea that hasn't affected anything and consequently never actually changed down the player's throat makes me want to throw up a little. I think a lot of it can be attributed to the fact that the creators said they were apprehensive about making Alir a heroic character, but also about making him too much of a coward, because clearly those are the only two things a protagonist can be. At one point, the whole of Nintendo itself had to intervene to tell them to make him less of a beta. This, consequently, made him settle somewhere awkwardly in the middle where his actions don't represent what I'm told he thinks. A protagonist is meant to embody the journey that they've embarked on and the conclusion you're meant to come to at the end. In this way, I suppose he does represent the game in that it has absolutely no idea what it is and nowhere to progress, so conflict is fabricated and resolved on the spot. Both Alir's cowardice and the twist reveal that Sombron is his father are conflicts that resolve themselves immediately, created for no other reason than to pretend something is progressing. This even more prominently affects broader conflicts in the game, with all of the villains being at the center of it. Why are you helping us now? Beats me. I don't even know anymore. Right before she dies, Zephia drops the nuke that she can control goddamn time. This alongside her mind manipulation powers, which are actually her abilities to draw out draconic impulses, which she uses on Vale because she's a dragon, but she also uses it on Hortensia, who is not a dragon, because... We don't know. <laughs> she is telling you she can control time. Ho! Oh. Go back in time and kill Alir. Poop out another crystal and go. She's been capable of this before she decided to have a deathbed redemption, but instead gives the player a new MacGuffin so they can travel back in time, which they could already do with a different MacGuffin, to resolve a different fabricated conflict that could easily be removed if not for the sake of inorganically prolonging the map count and redeeming Zephia for some reason. Vale says what they do in the past will affect the future. The crystal they break in the past is then broken in the future. It's not a multiple timeline thing. Zephia could kill her enemy. In fact, as I understand it, our heroes could use this opportunity to go back and kill Sombron before Lumera dies. Contrivance is at the core of almost everything in Engage. Through the sudden introduction of an item or ability or personality trait, the story will progress in the way the writers need it to without first putting in the effort to establish any bounds and limitations, no matter how loose they could potentially make its rules. In this more extreme case of Contrivance in Engage, it is impossible to drop such earth-shattering information on the player to solve simple problems without applying it to every other scenario prior to the scene it's introduced. Without applying it to everything else, it will not be cohesive and will not be convincing. It creates more problems than it solves. While writing Engage, however, intelligence systems wanted their audience to be in a constant state of don't worry about it for 60 hours so they don't think about any of the meaningless slog on screen, then expect them to tune back in when the game decides it wants to try to make something happen, disconnected from the aforementioned slog. Why would you ask that of your fans? Sombron is Elios's most wanted on multiple accounts of making shit up. Why does Sombron feel the need to waste the emblem's power on raising his little house out of the ocean if he's just gonna get up and leave the universe anyway? Then to throw the emblems right back into Alir's hands? Isn't he gonna 
need those. There is a point where the game says they can't summon Elios's emblems outside of Elios, but Alir just does it anyway during the final battle. Also, the Zero Emblem from Somron's original world was capable of being summoned in Elios. They could try to rationalize Somron leaving the emblems behind for Alir to take with this rule, but they don't, and instead contradict themselves twice. Even if that was the case, you wouldn't like... Imagine you're the only guy with like an AR-15 in like a medieval world, and you come down and... <laughs> Till it's out of bullets, and then you go, well, time to get, and then you leave the gun. You wouldn't do that, right? <laughs> you don't leave it for them to study it. All <laughs> right. Cause they could fill it back up with bullets. <laughs> you could fill it back up. <laughs> yeah, right? Also, what are the optics of just kind of levitating up to him in the portal using the Somniel? I didn't know we could drive this thing. Would it have hurt to show that this was possible at least one or two times prior to this? Or like, incorporate it into the gameplay Mario Galaxy 2 style? Massive Alir head. Also, before this, why was the first order of business to break those three crystals anyway? Did they already know they could move the Somniel? If they had just established that Alir could move the Somniel earlier, then said that the crystals were preventing it from moving, that would have been an acceptable means of extending the map count. Also, if no one but those the Divine Dragon invites is able to reach the Somniel, why didn't Lumera put her rings up there for safekeeping, where they could never be stolen? Like they were. Immediately. Stupid in head? Marths be like, well obviously that's the Draconic Time Crystal, which lets you go back in time. Silly Alir. Not to be confused with this other crystal Zephia made, which also lets you go back in time. Or this crystal that Alir made, which doesn't do anything. Or these three crystals that we need to break now, which do. Or this unbreakable enchanted helmet that Sombron made, which brainwashes Vale and then is broken. Or one of these 12 rings. Sorry, there's 13 now, but actually this one isn't an emblem, it's a birthday gift. Sorry, there's 14 now, but actually this one isn't an emblem, it's a pact ring. Sorry, there's 15 now, but actually this one isn't just an emblem, it's the zero emblem. The fell dragon is behind the rise of the corrupted in this kingdom. Sovereign blood is no longer enough for him. He is no longer satisfied by sovereign blood. Now he needs... Normal blood! <laughs> Apparently, this is how the Corrupted are made. I'm to believe Vale makes most of the Corrupted in her brainwashed form. She says she makes better Corrupted than Sombron, which is essentially just a form of resurrection. It's pretty incredible that they don't make a bigger deal out of this in and of itself, considering it creates its own plot holes, like... Why didn't she resurrect Marnie? Or Lumera? It's not as though it's too late. Sombron revives a corrupted Lumera after this. Anyway, Vale needs Zephia and her mind control to put her at peak performance to make her make superior corrupted. Then Sombron is needed to make an enchanted helmet to give to Zephia to put on Vale to put her at peak performance and able to create better corrupted than him, at which point you have to wonder why Sombron isn't just capable of it himself. And eventually he just is, which ties a nice little bow on that circle of confusion. When Alir dies for the first time, and <laughs> I suppose we all die for a first time. When Alir dies for the first time and enters the afterlife, paths from Attack on Titan, Vale, who is very much alive, also shows up for an unnecessary scene where Alir tells her what she already knows she can do, bring him back to life as a corrupted. Because Vale isn't allowed to do anything for herself, I guess. What is this place? How did Vale get here? Was this extra confusion really even necessary for a scene so pointless? Further acknowledgement of this thing we already know can happen also just corroborates the idea that Vale's resurrection would work on other characters. At that point, why doesn't she just use it on units when they die? The only reason Alir died again after he was brought back to life was that he summoned all the emblems, which no one else can or will need to do, meaning the average person can escape death with no real consequence. Then, after Alir's Second, death, the emblems resurrect him by way of immortalizing him as an emblem. However, the established consequences simply don't apply to Alir, like the incorporeal effect that all of the other emblems have, or the need to be summoned or worn, or even just retaining his blue hair and color palette. There isn't a single concept of Engage that is not impacted by contrivance. The one time they attempt to set up a conflict, it goes as follows. In one of Alir's three encounters with Vale, he wraps a bandage around an injury she got on her leg. Then, when Vale later betrays Alir, he says, It can't be. But that's the bandage I used to dress her wound. What? What do you mean? 
What do you mean? There's the bandage. That's her. Look at her, dumbass. You see anyone else that looks like that? Despite the writer's best efforts to make this make sense, it still doesn't make sense. When contrivance is applied to the entirety of a story and not just one or two elements, the result is that fan fiction-esque go to place, encounter important characters effectively by happenstance, and because there's no meaningful end toward which anything needs to be set up, create and solve a problem on the spot, then create 10 more problems by proxy and resolve none of them. Repeat. Because there's so much contradictory information, trying to establish something that does make sense and does have emotional impact at any point only calls attention to that prior contradiction. It's already betrayed any trust. It's a waste of the game's time and a waste of the player's time. Anyone who writes, whether as a hobby or a career, will know that starting place, full of contrivance and confusion. It's indicative of a story with unrealized purpose or without purpose at all, because it lacks that framework of meaning, the overarching goal that the writers can reference when they find themselves stumped with how to progress. Returning to Alir as our core example of contrivance, let me quickly get anecdotal. <laughs> she got anecdotal. <laughs> I know this sounds contrarian because people are refreshed to have a speaking protagonist, but Alir's voice makes no difference to me if he isn't going to say anything valuable or just contradicts himself. In fact, the game was better in moments where Alir wasn't present or was silent for the majority of a scene. Alir has a severe case of what I like to call Danganronpa dialogue. Instead of adding his own ideas or opinions to information he just learned, he chronically repeats the last thing said to him in the form of a question like he has palilalia. Our people are being attacked attacked by these... these... creatures. Creatures? What kind of creatures? Emma, are you a Danganronpa fan? In your in your heart of hearts, your truest soul. Would you <laughs> I don't think you could call me that, no. <laughs> you have a figure of Nagito Komaida it's in your room. It's not mine. <laughs> it's in your room, so how do I know it's not yours? What the hell? <laughs> it was planted on me. It's not mine! <laughs> I'm not sure if there's a huge difference between male Alir and female Alir, but there were some elements that I think would be different in her that I found unbearable in him, like the voice acting. I'm not quite sure though, because I don't necessarily attribute to the voice actor the bland delivery of lines, his incredibly slow delivery of lines, which are often repetitive. My country has possessed the ring of the young lion. The ring of the young lion or the tone that always makes him sound condescending or downright creepy. You shouldn't compare yourself to others like that. Everyone has different skills. Be a little more kind to yourself, okay? Like I said, you've earned a bit of confidence. <laughs> if anyone can, you can. A gift? That isn't necessary, Citrine. I only did what anyone would have done. There are a few times where his voice actor does a fine job selling emotion. I attribute it more toward the dialogue and character the voice actor was given to act. For the majority of the game, Alir is perceived as the divine dragon, who is a deity to the people of Elios and the figurehead of the largest religion in the world. Yet worshippers have no idea what the divine dragon looks like, to the point where every new character introduction begins with, I am the divine dragon. I'm the divine dragon. I'm I'm the, the divine, divine dragon. dragon. I'm, I'm the, the divine, divine dragon. dragon. Or the divine dragon. You're the divine dragon. The, the divine, divine dragon. dragon. The, the divine, divine dragon. dragon. The divine dragon is here in my desert. Despite multiple people of the faith supposedly visiting him while he was asleep, no ceremonies, expectations, or testaments have been established around him or Lumera in the last 1,000 years to ground the religion. Okay. Do your best to your voice. Can I give me a line? I'm the divine dragon. I'm the divine dragon. <laughs> That good. Early on in the game, Alir and Alfred travel to Brodia, where they meet the country's second prince, Alchrist. He shoots at Alir, nearly killing him, and demands they name themselves. Upon Alir declaring that I'm the divine dragon, Alchrist becomes instantly apologetic and ashamed that he shot at him. Then he comes out with the fact that he was apparently sent to greet the divine dragon here at the border, and that he knew he was coming because Queen Eve informed them. Several questions immediately arise from this. Why does Alchris not know what Alir looks like, considering Alfred, Saline, and many others have seen him? Alchris himself, I imagine, could have seen Alir. This is common knowledge, and he looks pretty memorable, no? 
If we assume all Chris never went to Lethos, then why wouldn't Queen Ev inform Brodia when and how they'll be arriving and what it'll look like, especially considering Alir is traveling with her heir? Why doesn't Alchrist know what the neighboring prince looks like? Since Alchrist apparently doesn't know how to identify this party of two very important figureheads, but simultaneously knew they were coming, why doesn't he first ask who they are before doing what he seems to think is an absolutely unforgivable thing? The shoddy answer Citrine gives is that they expected them to arrive more formally and more heavily guarded, but that doesn't change the fact that Alchrist just did something incredibly bold, rash, and out of character. Then that also poses the question, why are Alir and Alfred traveling alone and unguarded? The game stops bothering to answer the questions at this point. Essentially, in this scene, the story bends the rules of what its characters know and think to try to create a tense establishing scene for Brodia, but then immediately contradicts itself because of its lack of understanding of what it wants for its own world and characters, simplicity or complexity. What results is a scenario that tries to tell the player how important Alfred and Alir are through Alchrist's dialogue, but fails to show that in any of the characters' actions. This also happens with characters explicitly meant to kill Alir. Like in the case of Chapter 18, where Alir has to actively tell an Illusion soldier, someone who is meant to be his staunch political enemy that he is fighting at this very moment, who he is. I'm the Divine Dragon. The Divine Dragon. No, of course, this concept isn't fleshed out because the divine dragons as deities thing is just a mechanism through which intelligent systems can make the characters around the player consistently in love with them and willing to drop to their knees and worship them at the drop of a hat. Alir usually discourages people worshipping him to his face, but when he does, what the player is shown once again makes him sound like he's being disingenuous because there's simultaneously this constant need to give him the moral high ground in his interactions with other characters. The ones I can think of off the top of my head are his supports with Citrine. What sort of gift would you be more inclined to accept? To be honest, I would prefer the kind of gift that money can't buy. Something that money cannot buy. Hortensia. How come you're not fawning over me? I'm unimaginably cute. I don't treat people differently just because they're cute. Kindness matters much more. Marin. Yes, I am a dragon, but I also have feelings. I don't appreciate being gawked at like an animal. Divine One, I'm so sorry. You're a truly divine being. Fram, Alfred, Lapis, and Clan. The supporting characters are dumbed down to inhuman levels so that Alir can give some obvious moral lecture to them. Or maybe they were always that inhuman, but the problem still remains. In having him deny that they should be worshipping him while the game frames Alir to be more intelligent and kind, they simultaneously say that the characters are doing it for a good reason, because Alir is so cool. I have to wonder if the writers genuinely think it makes people feel good enough to have the waifus at their beck and call that it's worth multiple inconsistencies forming within its world and characters. From what I've seen, this is something that's generally disliked. <laughs> the divine one looked right at me! This would be fine if his standing was developed into the world so it had some world-building relevant purpose that the characters could talk about, and it wasn't just a transparent means to stroke the player's ego. Either that, or if he truly had insightful and thought-provoking dialogue, so that his wisdom didn't need to be fabricated by making the other characters less intelligent when they're around him, or even worse, ignoring the fact that he has little to no life experience compared to them because of his amnesia. In this situation, shouldn't he be the one learning from them? That would give the other characters the spotlight instead of Alir, who has the entire main story devoted to him. The only instance I can think of where he's the one learning something from someone else is when he randomly doesn't know what a mercenary is, despite them explicitly existing in Engage's world, and the random inconsistencies between what Alir does and doesn't know suddenly makes him look stupid. Mercenary? What do mercenaries do? You stupid! This is a textbook example of contrivance. When and where Alir's amnesia comes into effect is entirely at the writer's discretion, without any lines drawn as to what he does and does not remember. The writers skirting around the fact that Alir has zero life experience is indicative that his amnesia is a plot device used to preserve twists and give exposition, a very common use of amnesia in fiction. 
Lumera is evidence of this, and her impact on the rest of the story is tarnished because of it. She spends the first few hours of the game going on in some of the most blatant exposition I've ever seen, the most central example of telling and not naturally showing, all while Alir does not remember who this woman is, and then she immediately dies after she's finished. Elios had known peace for eons, but then... A dark presence emerged. Generations, the divine we could not determine where he'd come from. Peace and prosperity. But Once seeing the destruction he wrought, this may be a sign there was no that doubt his return would be a way to I wonder if it is a miracle. Now that he's oh, we're <laughs> going on this <laughs> This may be a sign. We're still we're not done yet. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah, this is like really bloated. Can I play the game? As we already know, this brand of exposition generally does not work, so Lumera becomes an incredibly ineffective means of info dumping at the very beginning of the game, and then dies to give Alir some kind of motivation. Actually, it's hardly even motivation, because it's not as though Alir seeks revenge, or a way to bring her back, or even to remember what he's forgotten about her. As soon as Lumera hits the floor, we forget all about the fact that he doesn't know her. She's more of a means to give the player some artificial connection to Alir in a scene that shouldn't even exist based on what we know about Alir's amnesia. So, after Lumera dies, everyone cries in an unearned death scene so long that my Nintendo Switch actively went into rest mode because the controller had gone untouched for so long. Why are you expositing while she's dying? She really talking and talking! I know, oh my god. This is going on for a real long time. Stop. Stop! <laughs> it keeps going! Oh, sorry. The switch went great because the scene is so long! It's trying to go into sleep mode! <laughs> it's still going! Oh, fucking finally, dog! Whoa! Alir has a sobbing fit, the hardest one, mind you, when he's right next to Vander, who's lived with and devoted his entire life to Lumera, despite the fact that Alir's memories of Lumera consist only of listening to her explain to the player everything that will be important about the game for an hour straight. The idea that Engage is both not taking itself seriously and is simple is simply untrue. Engage takes itself seriously to a fault, while simultaneously being incomprehensible. As a result, there is constant sobbing, constant dramatic music, and the developers actively expect you to be crying along. <coughs> Sutomu Te, the director of Engage, said, We have a lot of characters, so I hope many players will relate to the story and cry and laugh along with the characters. If you find a favorite character in this game, we hope you'll continue to be a fan of them for many years to come. We believe that the charm of the Fire Emblem games is that players become attached to the characters. In this seven minute back and forth bonanza of nothing, all the prior setup of Alir's dialogue and Lumera's role contradicts it. Because this establishing scene is so contrived, nothing is or can be set up, and so it tries to justify itself by going on for as long as humanly possible, with as much crying and as much sad violin as it can layer, until it does a 180 back to reveal itself to be meandering without any point. I started playing Octopath Traveler 2 recently, and I couldn't help but compare one of the scenes in that game to this one. In the beginning of Hikari's story, you play as the second prince of the nation, Ku, who is preparing for a battle with another country Ku is subjugating. Are you praying, Hikari? Don't waste your breath. If you're going to pray, pray for the ones fighting for their lives, not those already in the dirt. For a brief moment, Hikari is shown beside another character, Ritsu, and they have a short back and forth that reveals their conflicting ideals about the battle ahead. From this natural yet pointed dialogue, we learn that Hikari is sympathetic toward the people Ku is killing, as well as his own people who have died for what he sees as a meaningless conflict. Ritsu expresses the opposite belief, which is the prevailing ideology of Ku. Then let's join the fray, Ritsu.
Octopath similarly thrusts you into the action in both an effective tutorial as well as a good hook and establishment of ideas from which conflicts will later be able to wordlessly arise. It seamlessly shows the audience what will later be important facts. That coup is absolutely ruthless, which characters align themselves with that ideology as well as the power scaling of the characters and factions present. Near the end of the battle, Hikari spares the enemy general, only to watch him be immediately beheaded by his elder brother Mugen. Mugen espouses a similar ideology as Ritsu, albeit a little more intensely, but the battle is won. The king himself graces the battlefield afterward, despite his frail state. Our enemies have been put to heel, their forces crushed under our might. The nation of Ku shall know prosperity untold. Your Majesty. Hikari, I tire of this heat. Following this is a small time skip, and Hikari is sent to oversee a town in Ku. One of Mugen's men, who's causing trouble in the local tavern, claims that the position given to Hikari means he's been banished from the castle and ostracized by his family for his cowardly views. These encounters, alongside a few villager NPCs, both set up Hikari's connection to the town, his ideals, and his position, as well as swiftly slip in some more uniform, fun battles. Hikari's father then visits alongside his retainer, and he tells him that at the end of his reign and life, he's realized that all he's done to strengthen Ku and dominate its surrounding land has been ultimately meaningless and left only hatred in its wake. He has found value in Hikari's soft-heartedness. He sent him to oversee the town to hone these aspects of him and then ask for his conclusion. What does he want for Ku? After his time spent gaining the trust and loyalty of the citizens of Ku, the answer he gives is friends and allies. This conclusion is what spurs the king to tell Hikari he wants to bequeath the throne to him and not Mugen. He wishes to break Ku's endless cycle of violence and make peace for a brighter dawn. Leaving a bewildered Hikari behind, the king then goes to ask Mugen, who knows his frail father intends to take his birthright away, the same question. He of course responds with strength, the value that Ku instills in in all of its army, perhaps for its own perceived survival. In the meantime, Hikari uncovers a plot that Mugen has been preparing to assassinate his father, where the game cleverly integrates another tutorial of the bribing mechanic, but Mugen was one step ahead. The leaked information misleads Hikari away from Ku, where he is stalled by a turncoat bitter Ritsu as the town in Ku with all of Hikari's allies is put to the torch. I have to follow the strongest. I told you history would remember my name. Lord Mugen has promised me it will echo through generations. <sighs> So you see, it's nothing personal, Hikari. I must protect my people. So I say once more, and once more only. Let me pass. That's the spirit. Time to claim your spot on this hill. Ritsu. Now it begins. Hikari fends off Ritsu, then goes to find his father defeated and slain by Mugen. <laughs> the king lives just long enough to get his final words in and. Ready for this? Ready? Hikari, will you lead our nation? I will. I will be king. And I'll set Ku free of this bloodshed. Run. Gather your strength. Your allies. Only then can you restore the light to our nation. 
because everything has been set up prior to this, we don't need to bloat the player's experience with excessive crying and unpointed dialogue. I'm not bawling my eyes out, but it's straight to the point and is the definitive moment where the conflict we've set up and Hikari's goals are kicked into motion. It's an introduction that doesn't contradict what happens before or after it. Rather, it is made by the things that happen before it so that it can be as pointed as possible. All this in a time frame that is actively shorter than that of the beginning of Engage. If Engage wasn't taking itself seriously, this monster of a scene would be cut into an iota of its current length because it should understand that it has no purpose. Cohesiveness and simplicity will come naturally when there is purpose, and it certainly isn't at the expense of good gameplay, especially when it's as concise, simple, and unobtrusive as Octopath has made it. Comparing this once again to persuasive writing, for example, an argument that has a shoddy foundation will be meandering and ultimately make no greater point. Engage also isn't simple in the slightest. It's easily one of the most convoluted experiences I've had as they try to give my information intaking brain the runaround with boobs and a new crystal or ring every once in a while, as though it didn't just create 20 more problems to solve one that didn't even need to exist in the first place. Many of these elements exist to artificially extend the game's runtime and map count without first putting the necessary thought into it. Once again, the only way it's simple is if you actively ignore almost all of the elements that it introduces. I'm not quite sure why we're excusing this poor storytelling as being unserious or simple, when true simplicity is a virtue of stories that must be worked toward almost equally as hard as complexity. Deducing what is and is not important information for the player to know is something that needs to be thought about in relation to what the point is. Octopath, it has very simple morality. It's like Mugen's bad guy. I'm good guy. <laughs> like, oh, it's not that hard. Because I doubt at the end of Octopath that Mugen's gonna be like, here's my backstory. Because we know he's, his backstory, right? He's in Ku, period. Since I completed this prologue in Octopath, I have been eagerly waiting to get back into Hikari's story. I'm ready to face Mugen and Ritsu again to retake Ku and understand why I need to and why I should want to. The remainder of Octopath could absolutely blow it, but this beginning hook has excited me to gather my friends and allies and forge a kingdom of fellowship, not of bloodshed. Hikari game! Hikari squad! Bust that like button if you- <laughs> if your protagonist is Hikari. I'd like to point out that the very beginning of Fire Emblem Engage, the beautiful cutscene that thrusts the player into the action and into a place of anticipation for Engage to lead them to this moment, does not exist. It does not, at any point, take place in the story. This conflict with Sombron and Alir and all his allies in this place and this moment will never and has never happened. The conflict Engage does end with is entirely different. There is never an explanation as to what this beginning is, why it was shown, or if the player is even supposed to remember it. The beginning of a story is its most valuable asset. Unlike the similarly structured, gameplay-focused beginning of Hikari's chapter in Octopath, there's no connection here to the rest of the game at all. I continue to be bewildered by this every time I remember it. As a foundation and a hook which is completely divorced from the rest of the story, I ask myself, why was the beginning of Engage even shown to me? In analyzing the rest of the game, I believe I've found my answer. In the case of a story with underlying meaning, Show Don't Tell recognizes the audience's intelligence and ability to understand information, be it mechanical or emotional, that is subtly and naturally given to them. It also explicitly affects the story enough to know that it is really there. This careful balance is, of course, very difficult to achieve when there is no underlying meaning. Makoto Yukimura, whom I would consider one of the greatest modern writers and the creator behind the ongoing series Vinland Saga, gave an insightful answer to a question in an interview with Kodansha Comics that eloquently captures the importance of writing something communicative, something with universality, as he says, as well as the general effectiveness of inspiration and purpose. When asked, what advice would you have for aspiring writers or comic artists looking for inspiration, Yukimura said, quote, There is one thing I would like to proposed young people who dream of being manga creators do. Always ask yourself why. To yourself, to your work, keep asking why. 
Why? Why do I write this piece? Why did I pick this setting? Why does this turn of events occur in the story? Why did I make this character appear? Why did I kill this character off? Or why did I let them live? Why is this building constructed that way? Why is a tree growing there? Why is the mountain this shape and why is it here? Why? I ask why to everything. Some questions are easily answered, some things you can find out right away by doing research in books. However, there will always be some questions to which the answers are hard to find. Even if you do figure out the answer for the moment, that answer may lead to even bigger, even deeper questions that will most likely be the core of your work. Something like that with so much universality captured within must be written about. Perhaps it is even worth risking your life to write about. If you can ponder it, agonize over it, and keep chasing it, and then somehow transform that process into entertainment, you will probably create something good. It seems some people stop in the middle of their chase for understanding universality. That's why I believe that there is meaning in continuing to ask why even more, going even deeper, even further for everyone's sake. Then, after you've thought everything out and finally obtained the answer, it'll probably be hard to contain. You'll want everyone else to hear it. Most likely, you'll feel a new sense of of duty to relay this answer to others. Until that happens, keep asking questions. That is how I write my manga." End quote. If Engage suffers primarily from anything, it is a lack of purpose. This is an angle many writers will identify with, because at some point or another in our hobbies or careers, it's more than likely an aspect we've struggled with. This purpose is what drives artists to create, the message they want their audience to consider. It's the reason for their creation's existence. In my experience, struggling to find that helpful framework was a matter of being a little kid. I had untenable and surface-level feelings about the world around me, much less some idea of how I wanted to portray those feelings. Anytime I took up my pencil, or more accurately my phone's notes app, what would come out was confused and unpointed in a way similar to Engage. Rather than framing everything around one big theme, I instead had six or seven random fake deep ideas that popped into my head that I was obligated to do something with in order to fulfill that initial cool individual concept or scene. I imagine many other people have had similar experiences writing at a young age. That feeling of thinking, wouldn't it be cool if something like this existed? And then struggling to write anything substantiating that one scene or character that sounds cool because the proper setup becomes tiresome. Many young writers' projects are probably abandoned for this reason. This might be why creating fanfiction is so popular for people just looking to write for fun. The setup has already been done. Without the underlying meaning of a project being something we personally are invested in, it becomes grating to write and unpointed. It's very fickle. For good reason, I think. To spend as much time as it takes to write a story you don't find personal investment in is a talent unto itself. Of course, the writers at Intelligent Systems aren't children devoid of a viewpoint. Point. Rather, I think in writing a series so long-standing, their inspiration has become obligation. Pokemon is a worryingly similar example. Coming off of the 21st installment of the series, or more depending on how you count them, they've managed to keep an endearing face, but their devotion to telling inspired stories has waned on and off. Now they prioritize making a new game as often as humanly possible, regardless of quality. At the end of the day, Pokemon will always succeed no matter the story, or even the performance at times. It's become a mere backdrop for the cute, marketable plushies to exist in. Sometimes Game Freak will wait up feeling like they want to write, other times they'll see that Sword and Shield was, for a time, the best-selling game on the Switch, and promptly go back to sleep. For the sake of benevolence, I'll clarify that I enjoyed Sword and Shield a little and thought it had potential, but that's besides the point. <laughs> this is a result of Game Freak's obligation to put out a new game every year. Fire Emblem Heroes, the mobile app released by Nintendo in 2017, is the first gacha entry of the series. Gacha, as I'm sure you know, is a pretty word for loot boxes, gambling for some reward in gameplay, the reward being the characters you've come to know and love. In Heroes, you build your team with the characters you get from gambling and challenge other players and their teams. Fire Emblem Heroes is Nintendo's first mobile investment to reach $1 billion in revenue, and the most critically successful mobile game in 
Nintendo's history. That being the case, enjoying Fire Emblem already seems more conducive to enjoying the gacha format than other Nintendo series with similar apps. Fire Emblem is already filled with hundreds of distinct and beloved characters, with established stories and personalities. It's too perfect not to succeed in a gacha setting. One billion dollars in revenue is likely not spread across an equal number of players, though. Heroes, in its six years since launch, has amassed a humble 18 million downloads, compared to Nintendo's Super Mario run and its 310 million downloads. Crunch those numbers and the result might not look so crazy, around $56 per every player. Ignoring the fact that that's near triple A price for a mobile game, the result is still not too accurate to reality. Considering a large number of those downloads are from people that may never have touched the app or gotten rid of the app since their initial download, or that many people have never spent a cent on it and simply resign themselves to the free handouts the game will occasionally give them, it's more likely that a smaller portion of that 18 million spends an extremely exorbitant amount on the app. In my observation of longtime players of Genshin Impact and other gacha games, the largest number I've seen a random individual claim they've spent on these games is $2,000. I'm positive there are players who have spent more. In gacha communities, these players are called whales, I've learned. Many of the fans of these games, not just the whales, are children, or very young adults that are being introduced to what could be considered an addiction before it may otherwise even be legal. I encourage gamers to spend their money however makes them happy, but this is, just for reference, the environment that Intelligent Systems has begun to dip its flagship franchise into. I know we're all desensitized to the existence of these things by now, but I remember dearly a time only a few years ago when EA was the gaming community's devil for the loot boxes they stuffed their games full of. That seemed to change around a certain point in 2020. I can't remember when that was, though. Do you consider loot boxes to be a, an, an ethical feature of your games? Well, first, we don't call them loot boxes. I think that we look at it as, as surprise mechanics. Now, we're surrounded by surprise mechanics. They're just painted pink and covered in anime stickers. Those stickers also just happen to have the all-time record biggest boobs and thighs of all time, and it seems to be something fans gambling for the characters are very receptive to. Engage's visual aspects are also contrived toward this end. There's obviously a level of subjectivity to how the character designs in Engage are received. Apparently Sprinkles over here with the incredibly unsubtle waist windows is the big waifu at the moment. Whether someone likes these designs or not generally depends on if they find it sexy or cute or what have you, and that is okay. On a level isolated from a grander world and large cast, how pleasing something is to look at will always depend on personal taste. However, when these designs are supposed to collectively and individually represent something, they begin to harm the story in a very literal sense of show don't tell. Generally, I agree that ignoring practicality and bending the rules to make something that looks cool or accentuates a character's personality or role can be a good thing. But when applicability isn't even considered, it always hurts the story or shows where it was already lacking. When designs have no meaningful substance alongside a subjective style, I believe it's fair to criticize it as if it were a part of the story because, well, because it is a part of the story. It tells me that there's no substance to the world or characters, or that the artist was actively told to disregard substance and just make something eye-catching or marketable. When the game devs asked Mika Picasso to design for this game, and she said she, quote, was concerned with some of the character designs because she usually only draws young-looking characters, I can only imagine the devs looking at her then looking to each other, then looking back to her, and going, even better. The house has got to go. Get some self-respect, you miserable sack of shit. The place just needs a woman's touch. No woman would touch this place. Many of Fire Emblem Heroes' recent original characters have a pattern similar to what's seen commonly in Engage. Naturally, as a good company would, Intelligent Systems wants to embrace their similarities. Engage itself, the main series console entry, can't seem to escape gacha mechanics. An impactful, albeit optional, mechanic in the game, getting stat buffs from bond rings, is settled conveniently next to another Another mechanic that's not so optional, the emblem rings. The bond rings are, of course, obtained through a gacha system. Now, given this system is based on in-game currency and not real money, is this system fun? <laughs> Is this the riveting gameplay I keep hearing game reviewers talk about? 
Anyone could give someone a button to mash for a few minutes, which will sometimes give them a thing they want, and they will inevitably get bored and want to move on. That on its own would be considered a poor aspect of gameplay. The standard for this specific thing labeled gotcha is so low, however, that the impulse to defend it is to say, well, at least you didn't have to pay for it. I guess I don't have to pay to bang my head off a brick wall 30 times either, but I still don't think I would enjoy it. The only reason this mechanic is presented in this way is to encourage players to become acclimated to gotcha systems, and then funnel them into heroes, which the creators have been very vocal about wanting. If you are interested in emblems, the past heroes, I recommend you try out the Fire Emblem Heroes mobile game. You'll meet many heroes, including the emblems that appear in Fire Emblem Engage, and there are also weapons and items you can get by linking the app with this title. I also hope that by playing Fire Emblem Engage, players will become interested in Fire Emblem Heroes as well as the past titles. No other game got this weird random advertisement out of left field in the director interviews. Along with being advertisements for heroes, emblems, and perhaps the entirety of Engage itself, exists as an advertisement for the games they're presumably going to start remaking consistently, a la Pokemon. It's an actively bad advertisement though, case in point being that I still vividly remember when Sigurd randomly spoiled his own game for me in broad daylight with the most throwaway line of all time. And to leave a child behind. I did that in death. Huh? Why would you say that to me? This insidiousness began even before the game was released. Four of Engage's characters were prematurely dropped into heroes to be gambled for. At the Game Awards, the $30 DLC for Engage was announced, before the game came out, I remind you, and included a collection of lovable returning characters withheld from the main 12 emblems as if to dangle it tantalizingly in front of players unable to resist. You want Soren, don't you? And Camilla? You love Camilla. $30. It's only $30. Compared to, say, Bloodborne, whose significantly cheaper DLC, announced months after the beloved game's release, introduced hugely new content packed with effort. Strangely, elements that were very clearly stripped from the base game of Engage were later added with DLC. Although this DLC was free, it introduced aspects that should have existed in the Somniel the entire time. These things provided a more expedient way to get supports between characters, which was disastrously difficult to achieve as well as a much-needed purpose to the Somniel. The empty places in the Somniel where these extra activities would occur were there the entire time, but their purposes were deliberately removed. I'm not sure why they wouldn't just let this be in the game upon release. To maintain retention, maybe? As it stood in the base game, there was barely any purpose to the Somniel at all. The characters usually don't change their dialogue, and they never say anything insightful or particularly relevant. I vividly remember approaching Alfred after the battle where Alir dies and is revived twice, only for Alfred to give me the same repeating dialogue about his muscles he'd been repeating the entire game. Something I noticed while playing was that both the Somniel and the post-battle wandering were limited to two text boxes per character. As if making the dialogue repetitive wasn't good enough, they also needed to make sure what they could say was as minimal as possible. Aside from being able to see your allies in swimsuits, everything mechanical that was in the Somniel could have just been put in a menu to expedite the process and rid the player of the five long loading screens necessary to go from the world map to the empty Somniel to the arena, back into the Somniel, then into the ring room, and then back into the Somniel again just to learn and equip abilities. And now I present Alir's 30 minute long animation of him statically petting his dog so I can get some damn bond fragments. Not to mention the odd looking character models that the Somniel reveals when the characters are outside their usual outfits, as well as the fact that I I think they enlarge a select few of the female characters' boobs when in the Somniel? Guys, you're embarrassing yourself. Please just cover that up. <laughs> Adding this DLC to the base price of Engage, which many people who purchased the full game did, Engage becomes $90, effectively costing significantly more money than Red Dead Redemption 2. I know that's not really fair and not relevant, but somehow, in a sort of cynical sense, this doesn't feel right to me. <laughs> well, well. I guess uh, I'm afraid. Is Engage an anniversary game? 
Anniversary of what? Is this a celebration of the series? In their interviews, the creators seem to think this is a whole new direction for the series. Even if I were to grant Engage that, it still doesn't do a convincing job at communicating that this is a series that's going to be worth anyone's time in the near future. This is the obligation I talk about. Every careless element that coincidentally ends up indulging some type of vice points more and more toward this. That it is on every level of production made purely for financial gain. This isn't exactly mind-blowing. You could argue anything is made primarily for financial gain. Great things at that. But before this massive insurgence of greedy game developers like Nintendo, the quality of the art was usually separate from the marketing. The writers or artists aren't responsible for shoehorning something in that will draw people into their franchise. Their job is simply to create good art first and foremost. Advertisement exists as a separate job for a reason, and if the story is good, it will spread of its own merit. Of course, this isn't to say Engage didn't jump at the opportunity to have hyped up, misleading advertisement surrounding the story. A huge portion of the content shown in the initial trailers is either from the non-existent first cutscene, or centrally highlights this idea of an evil Shadow the Hedgehog looking Allure. When the player actually reaches this evil Allure, he exists for one chapter and is completely innocent. He's a whole victim. <laughs> I actually found myself more interested in this Alir story, but alas, one chapter later it was right back to Kirito. These things were all used as blatant trailer bait that had little to no relevance in the actual game. To many of these massive franchises, the art is less of a priority compared to what's marketable and will give maximum profit based on what the current escapism tactic is. It's difficult for inspired art to persist in an environment like this, because at the core of every question, why, the answer is monetary. For a series like Fire Emblem, whose existence as a role-playing game is so intrinsically tied to plot and characters, you'd hope this eventuality would never come to pass, but alas, I believe it has. Or at at least is. To be honest, my more casual fan side thinks a little bit of contrivance in a story is fine, so long as it's toward that grander, more positive purpose. A story can only be improved by establishing rules and sticking to them because it distracts less from the meaning while also making it more relatable to a broader audience. However, sometimes there's a case to be made for the opposite. This is usually where super cliche but equally beloved anime like Naruto or Dragon Ball fall. A little contrived and predictable when it isn't, but with a well-intentioned soul. But when there's no purpose to the art, no meaning at all, all there can be in every aspect of the story is contrivance. The outcome is no longer cheesy but lighthearted and inspiriting fun, it's lazy, sterile, and corporate. Contrivance isn't just a mechanical flaw, it's an emotional one as well. When there's no answer to any one why, there's nothing to direct conflict toward base conflict upon or resolve conflict on the basis of, and it becomes pointless to invest the audience in it. The art is soulless as a result, or at least has a very corrupt soul the further you question why. Considering the question why, let's return to the story of Engage itself. To be completely honest, this next segment felt impossible to script. It's been through so many rewritings and re-recordings, but none of them captured exactly what I wanted to convey. There were so many things I wanted to say about so many different parts of this game that it all just became one big scrambled mess of ideas without any greater point. Until I reminded myself, that's exactly how it feels to play Engage. <laughs> Because of how confused the game was, I was struggling to find a way to talk about all of it without also confusing myself. I'm tackling all these different little problems that are all a consequence of one greater issue. So I could try to talk about how Engage's non-existent world building gives zero context to the characters and conflicts in the story and makes the world feel completely empty. I could try to talk about how the castle breach battle format that happens in all four of Elios's countries not only taps into the repetitive nature of scenes in Engage, but also hurts their integrity as fictional countries. I wanted to talk about how the character designs fall back on conventionally attractive faces and cleavage or random details that clash with one another just to fill out space instead of considering who in Elios would wear what and how. I also wanted to talk about the fallacy of gimmick 
like characters and how very few people will like a large portion of the cast due to its reliance on a very specific and probably rare sense of humor. Hell, I even considered talking about how the music misses the mark because of the game's poor use of its only motif, its lack of meaning and symbolism that gives emotional context to the songs when they play. But at the end of the day, I would just be running around in circles pointing out symptoms of the diagnosis, that this game was made out of obligation and not inspiration. This lack of purpose is felt in every single element of the game, without exception. If stories are a form of persuasive writing, then a story without a purpose is like a persuasive essay without anything to be persuaded to believe. Without a point, it just becomes random words. When critiquing a story, I believe it's most important to consider what the writers wanted to portray with it. I'm here to critique writing, not morals, which means what I'm analyzing is the writer's effectiveness at being persuasive, at portraying their own message. I try to look for the greater meaning so that I can properly assess where they knocked persuasion out of the park and where they failed, then critique it by that metric. But throughout Fire Emblem Engage's story campaign, that baseline requirement and very helpful aid in writing was missing. I struggled to find meaning anywhere. In the beginning of the game, I thought Engage was going to say something about family. Families are at the forefront of almost every conflict in Engage. Lumera and Alir, Alfred, Celine and their mother, Diamant, Alchrist and their father, Ivy, Hortensia and their father, Tamara and Fogato, Vale, the four hounds as well, especially Zephia with her distorted perception of family and unconditional love. It even appears among minor characters supports with one another. Clan and Fram come to mind, but also Seedal and his mother, Kagetsu and the family he left behind, Anna's missing parents, Panette and Pandreo, the list goes on. I know having cast members that are related to each other is nothing new, but great attention is brought to familial relationships in the early to mid-game story missions. I expected this element of the game to come to a head somehow, so when those connections amounted to nothing during the story's climax, I knew I was seeing something in the little I was given that wasn't there. Though I should have noticed that because this theme was never really presented in such a way that it could be given a conclusive answer. It was just slapped on the table as a frequent element of the story, as though just by virtue of being common it meant something. There are a thousand different things you could say about family in a story. There's the blood is thicker than water approach, along with the opposite, disconnecting from your family to create your own and when it is acceptable to do so. Hell, even the somewhat overdone generational trauma theme. This is a complicated and nuanced topic with no shortage of content to be made of it, but Engage never delves into this theme beyond surface level acknowledgement, despite the topic taking up the bulk of main story screen time. All the different moments where this is relevant only confuse whether I'm supposed to think Blood Family is important or isn't important. As the game entered its final act, every climax that followed completely forgot that it was supposed to say something conclusive about the buildup that came before it, about family. Instead, in its biggest climaxes, Engage decided to go into some unrelated spiel about the more typical anime, my friends are my power and bonds are eternal approach. This new moral isn't inherently terrible, but was made terrible by the fact that there was nothing prior to this that was set up to make the player think this is what they should have been contemplating and appreciating for their entire journey. It's essentially the equivalent of buzzwords. The long-winded monologues may sound relevant or intense on the surface, but when there's nothing behind them, they're completely meaningless both to the characters in the story as well as the audience experiencing it. I should clarify that a story can commentate on more than one thing with separate story arcs and characters, but I do believe there's usually one overarching purpose to a story, which is concluded in its finale. The answer to everything you've just experienced and the weight of what you're hopefully made to consider. The loose ends are all tied together in the same bow that is the bigger picture. It's the core answer to the question question, why? Also, I don't believe that commentating on multiple things was the creator's intention with Engage. I simply believe that its trifurcated meaning was a coincidence as a result of having no intention. Otherwise, all three of the themes that this game could have portrayed would have proper setup, conflict, and payoff. So what you get is a beginning, middle, and end that are completely divergent from one another, and irrelevant climaxes that need to provide emotional
emotional context for themselves, rather than being built toward. Because of this, players can completely skip any main story scene of their choosing, and the impact of the game's climaxes, and even worse, its finale, remains unchanged. This is never a good thing. No scene should be considered a throwaway scene. Every chance a good writer gets to substantiate the point of their work should be seized. Meanwhile, Engage seems to encourage the skipping of dialogue at times, because it's so often repetitive and meaningless. I have never, not once in my life, been so compelled to rush through dialogue in my first playthrough of a game. The most egregious offenders of this are the emblems. This is unfortunate, but also unsurprising considering the state of the finale, because the emblems are the finale's centerpiece. The emblems are restricted to two different means of interacting with the story. The first is in meaningless supports with other characters that are two sentences max before you get to the A, which is then four sentences. I'll grant Engage that some of these can be entertaining, but not by any of the game's own merits. The characters from the other games are always the stars, simply by virtue of being from another game that already put in the work of making them likable. If they aren't restricted by a sentence count cap, then the emblems strictly speak to a leer in their redundant paralogues, when oftentimes the meaning behind their games and their journeys has very little to do with him. Leaf will tell me you can't put blood back into the body, so when it's spilled, make sure it's for a good reason about the inherent value of life, but it's never as though Engage does a bang-up job calling attention to the faceless mob of illusion soldiers you're slaughtering. If that's just not the story they're trying to highlight, then they aren't required to, but because of dialogue like this, it becomes highlighted, and half the things the emblems say become obsolete because what has been established as a core morally bad action in their games has not been shown in that light in this one. There's also so much repeating dialogue in the paralogues, once again usually from a leer, because the scenarios the emblems are put in are always identical and always address the same concepts with them every single time in the same way. Skipping what should be these cool, integral scenes leaves the finale unaffected because nothing in those cutscenes was building up to the finale anyway. This ending felt like such a 180 because it was shoehorned in solely to advertise the emblem characters and accentuate to the player that they should see them as a cool and desirable thing without putting in the work of making them do anything cool and desirable. Let us engage! Shine on! Emblem of beginnings! Mark! Because Engage is centered around this marketing concept rather than authentically conceived by an artist who was inspired to tell a story and knew how to communicate an idea, it actively fails at integrating said marketing concept. Lumera's death should be an exception to Engage's inability to set up and pay off conflict. It's the climax of the beginning of the story, so it needs to provide a foundation for the rest of the story to come, as well as hook the audience. This was not the case. As we've established, it's not as though we're witnessing a son truly mourn his mother in this scene because Alir does not know Lumera. In the same way, it's also not as though they acknowledge this, like it's meant to be a subconscious part of Alir that he doesn't remember or understand that's crying for her. The sole emotional crux of this story is Alir's drawn out and contradictory crying, as opposed to something meaningful that would progress and change. I wholeheartedly believe even the writers knew this beginning was incredibly weak, both as a foundation and as a hook. This is where the unexpected explained beginning cutscene and tutorial come from. It has no place in the grander scheme of the story and exists purely to give fabricated anticipation. The hook of this cutscene was attached to something completely non-existent in the rest of the game, and it was done intentionally so. Despite being so ineffective, Lumera's death is still harkened back to multiple times. Let's pick one of the moments that call back to that scene and dissect it. Cut out the fat and see if they can justify it. What the purpose of reintroducing this idea is and how this beginning provides a foundation for what follows. So Alir, Alfred, and Selene have just rescued Queen Ev from Zephia and the Illusions, and Lumera is brought up in conversation. Alir is forced to inform her Lumera is dead, and what ensues is a back and forth of unpointed dialogue, which we've essentially already heard from Alfred and Alir, between two characters.
characters that could provide a much more unique perspective. You are blessed with the same powers as your mother. How is Queen Lumera? Well, she's... she's gone. My mother passed away. No! That's awful! I'm so sorry. Some intruders entered the castle. They tried to kill me, but she gave her life to protect mine. Oh, how tragic. I'm glad that... that I could spare your children the pain of losing their mother. <sighs> My heart goes out to you. Forgive me. We've only just met, and here I am, laying my grief at your feet. I just wish I could have saved her, too. Divine One, while I cannot take away your sorrow, perhaps I can help you bear it. To reunite with her and then lose her so soon, I can only imagine how painful that was. For now, allow yourself to grieve knowing that I grieve with you. Thank you, Queen Eve. Your warmth, your kindness. It's almost like she's here with me. How are you feeling? Better. I'm sorry you had to see me like that. No, we shouldn't have dragged you into all this right now. I'm sorry, Divine One. As am I. All this essentially amounts to an exchange that says, I'm sad, I'm sorry, I'm sad, I'm sorry, over and over until it's done. Every time Ev speaks, it's to say some derivative of what sounds like the inside of a grieving card to a distant cousin whose cat just died. Other than that, it's to say she supports Alir, which never amounts to anything because Ev never appears again after this scene. Alfred and Celine do the same thing. What do you mean you shouldn't have dragged Alir into all this right now? You just got done telling me your frail little country was under horrible siege. When did this suddenly become a Facebook thread about your old high school friend's deceased grandfather. Why is dialogue in this game written like a Twitter thread? I love being different. And I want everyone to know being different is amazing. Does Ev have anything to say about Lumera? About who seems to be her old friend? What about Lumera's role? What would it mean for the world if the Divine Dragon Queen were to die? Of course, every time Alir speaks, it's to slowly repeat the events of the story that the player just witnessed and come up with 10 different ways to spell out how sad he is, despite previously saying he wasn't even close enough to Lumera to take a gift from her. TLDR, the answer is no. Lumera's seven minute death is never justified or magically given some greater meaning. I counted seven times Engage does this same soulless deathbed monologue or redemption. Because of its inability to set anything up prior to it happening, characters must again provide emotional context to their deaths either right before or as it's happening. Lumera is the first and most obvious example of this, but Morian suffers the same issue of being introduced, albeit with someone more entertaining dialogue just to immediately die in the concurrent scene and provide some background for two characters that don't do or change very much anyway. Marnie, Zephia, and Gris each have their own version of these deathbed monologues as well. Marnie's being the same format as Morian's, and Zephia and Gris's being more literal in that they explain their backstories and desires to no one as they're dying. Lumera has a second deathbed monologue with Alir, as though the first wasn't enough, and then Sombron has his with the Zero Emblem at the very end. I think you can make a case for one of these. Seven, however, becomes a pattern of incompetency. Where Zephia and Gris's death scene had potential and touched on interesting topics that seemed relevant at the time, Marnie and Sombron's are two of the worst. For the entire duration of her role in the story, Marnie is portrayed as a maniac, committing countless atrocities for the sake of the fell dragon, alongside the other four hounds. They then attempt to very seriously redeem her to the player after this. The way they achieve Marnie redemption is to have her share her sad anime backstory with the player, then learn Vale's sad backstory, which then suddenly unlocks her empathy. Hard. I'm to believe that the burning and slaughtering of villages did not do this, but the ever so slightly upsetting story of the one named character she has hurt 
does. That's one way to make the world feel fake. Every time the player sees Sombron, his goals are constantly changing. First, it's simply to conquer Elios. Then it's to raise his kingdom, Gradlon, from the sea. Then it's to immediately leave and conquer all other worlds. Then, finally, in the last conflict, as he's dying, his true goal becomes to find the Zero Emblem, his companion who disappeared soon after he arrived in Elios. None of his actions before this even hinted that this was what he was after. The entire main story has so much repetitive dialogue made up of pointless platitudes reiterating that Alir is the, the divine dragon. dragon, that his mother is dead, and that he's sad, despite there being so many unrelated climaxes in need of buildup. This is because there was nothing else the writers wanted to add. There was no greater purpose these scenes needed to subtly build toward. When there are then issues with a lack of meaning or relevance to Engage's two biggest climaxes, I look back to all these scenes with no point and wonder, why didn't they set up a resolution to those problems here? It's because there was no thematic question the writers wanted to give an answer to, even if reworking earlier scenes with later irrelevant climaxes in mind to pose thematic questions could have made those irrelevant climaxes into answers, while simultaneously making earlier scenes more interesting. Essentially, the entire 60-hour experience became wasted time, both on the game's end and on the player's. There are smaller, more inconsequential examples of this, but they're equally as thoughtless and indicative of a lack of a grasp on who or what these characters and factions stand for, or a general narrative goal that needed to be achieved using them. Fogato is introduced as a very casual and laid-back character, who everyone is surprised as a prince upon learning so. He calls out to his mother, the queen, like this, and one scene. You wanted to be mom, right? Mom! Visitors! Then, immediately after cutting to the next scene, he starts acting like this. I was just doing what any prince would do for his queen. That's mom to you. My son tries to act so cool, so detached. Why? When I first met Lapis, her personality surprised me. After seeing pictures of her, I thought she was going to be the typical Moe girl that's also strong, funny, haha archetype. But when she spoke in the main story, she came off as rough and serious, similar to the rest of Brodia. I thought that maybe they were going to start introducing contentious characters that could grow somewhere. But as soon as I unlocked her as a unit, that repetitive and out of left field humble inoffensiveness kicked in, making her vanish into the rest of the smiling faces in my army. Elements of Engage's characters are manipulated on a whim without any regard for their implications beyond the task at hand, leaving them feeling inhuman and irrelevant. If contrivance is attached to characters in the main story, then it most certainly affects supports. Allow me to introduce you to this lovely quartet of supports I managed to unlock all in a row, which I have lovingly dubbed the Staring Circle. The first was Etie and Alir, in which Alir was kind of creepily staring at Etie while she was training. She tells him it's weird, but he doesn't stop. Then, in a support between Alir and Chloe, Chloe is staring at Alir while he's sleeping. He then tells her it's kind of weird and to stop. I then unlock the Alir and Louis support, in which Alir approaches Louis to ask why he likes staring at people, because it's apparently his hobby. Finally, in the Chloe and Louis support, Chloe, after just staring at Alir, then also goes to ask Louis Damn these names! Fucking French people! Then also goes to ask Louis why he likes staring at people, because now she thinks it's weird, in which he responds with the same thing for a second time. Five or so minutes of cutscene later, not only have we strictly touched on the inherent and in this instance meaningless human ability to look at something, we have also contradicted who it is that looks at something excessively and who is looked at. This is a continuing trend throughout supports, where characters speak at length about things irrelevant to the subjects at hand, and also things inherent to everything living, like moving, eating, looking, but still manage to contradict themselves. All of this is occurring while some of these characters should have a much more unique dynamic, like Chloe and Louis, who have served the same liege for a long time, and would probably already know these surface level qualities about each other, especially considering they're the only things they talk about. The nature of these supports also has an adverse effect on character development. Supports in this game are so difficult to unlock that once you get someone's A, they're having five C's with five other characters. This means that anything they could learn 
children or any conversations they have with other characters cannot give the illusion of affecting them in any meaningful or pertinent way. Alchrist's A support with Diamant, in which he resolves to get stronger and eventually surpass his brother, which is a big deal for him, can and often will be unlocked alongside C supports that effectively reset any growth he had back to zero. If they just wanted a cast that was already grown and had regular old conversations, this would be fine, but at that point you'd hope they would actually do so. When each support chain feels like it's concluded with the moral of an episode of My Little Pony after a forcibly contrived scenario made by having the characters act like aliens or incredibly out of character, I think I could be forgiven for thinking they were supposed to be learning something from each other. In Yunaka's supports, I found one of, if not the most, melodramatic character among the cast. She insisted on constantly talking about her backstory, and it manifested itself in the most unintentionally funny ways possible. So, something about doing chores takes me right back to that place. It fills me with dread. Because singing killed my grandma, okay? Despite insisting that she doesn't want sympathy, she dramatically explains how she's killed hundreds, then supposedly felt bad enough about it to stop. However, her plans for the future consist of continuing to kill hundreds in this conflict in the most goofy outfit imaginable, and then retiring to a vacation home somewhere, as opposed to, I don't know, giving back to the world? As a result, the only narrative value she had was in having a backstory, but not really giving any definitive purpose or meaningful answer to it. By removing from the character the purpose and meaning, then the writer also removes any positive and meaningful impact the character could have made in their story and on their audience. Gold Mary, as a character, is supposed to be annoying and full of herself, but actually consistently does incredibly kind things, while occasionally saying, yeah, I'm so perfect, and because of what I'm watching her do, I don't think she's wrong. Because there's no conflict allowed to happen between characters, she literally is perfectly good. The only chance a character has at being a flawed and growing human being in this game is if they were at one point in time a villain. Ivy and Hortensia come to mind. Among the cast, they appear to have the most thought put into them. The two of them, being figureheads of Illusia, are drastically affected by the events of the main story, and it generally shows. Ivy and Hortensia have a chance to change their minds and develop around something, even if any relevant or interesting conflict that would naturally follow is stamped out and they blend into the rest of the cast and disappear almost as soon as they join. Even still, Hortensia and Ivy suffer similarly disjointed conversations that muddy the type of people they are. In her A support with Ivy, Hortensia has a touching conversation about how her mother had the same smile as her and that it got her through a terrible situation. This is something Hortensia is immensely proud of. Then in her C with Rosado, she immediately begins to complain about how she always needs to fake her smile because she's a princess, as though Ivy didn't just tell the player it was heartening and inherent. On the rare occasion that a conflict of interest between characters does arise, it's immediately dispelled. The very first time there's a conflict of opinion among the immediate main cast in the main story, it's between Alchrist and Ivy. This extremely tame conflict is instantly stamped out in their C support. Basically, Alchrist stands up for himself for the first time when Ivy joins the group after she just assisted in the death of his father. Upon this happening, I remember thinking, whoa, he's kind of grown for a moment. This man was kind of a unit in battles, so I already had some respect for him. But then Ivy apologizes in their C support, which I remind you she has already done <laughs> in the very main story cutscene that Alchris was mad at her in, and then he immediately goes, you apologize? Whoa, relationship mended. There is no dissenting in what I'm supposed to believe is a very diverse group of people from different places with unstable peace treaties or hostilities between them. This lack of greater purpose leads to a very, very severe lack of anything, anything at all to talk about. But I digress. Hortensia and Ivy were still the two most thoughtful characters in the game because they had actual relevance in the story, even if it never truly amounted to anything. I tried extremely hard to get invested in the characters and unlock as many supports as I could, but it raised the question to me. Should it be the player's responsibility to give characters a chance, or should it be the writer's job to actually incorporate them into the story in meaningful ways that make them interesting? At the very least, they should stretch to make the C supports eye-catching. Otherwise, players will be stuck in a loop of obligation to give them a chance, only to never be rewarded. Hortensia, for example, blew ass as a unit in my game, but I held on to her because when I poked the unmoving homunculus with a stick and implored it 
to do something, it actually did. When these characters are never present in the story, commentate on the story, or even just have some type of representative presence in the world or narrative, I hesitate to call them characters rather than faces with gimmicks that I think are supposed to be funny for the sole purpose of being units. It's important to stress that characters crafted around gimmicks or archetypes is not a desirable thing, because rather than relying on the player's ability to discern whether or not they were thoughtfully written, even if they personally don't like them, a player's experience with the characters relies entirely on whether or not they find their gimmick funny or hot. Example, I thought Kagetsu was funny. Did that make him a well-written character? Hell no! <laughs> Initially, I thought the best support in the game was the chain between Diamant and Fram. It was between two characters that, outside of speaking with Alir, weren't entirely based on a gimmick. I know that's a hot take, but I, I think Fram was actually fine. It's, it's Alir that's the problem. <laughs> They were also speaking, albeit not extensively in any way, about something that actually pertained to the world around them, the historic invasions of Illusia conducted by Brodia. Fram is distraught while attempting to learn history because it's so grim, but Diamant stresses a promise to her that as king, he will strive to make a future with no war, by virtue of knowing and circumventing history. Then, however, in the A support between Diamant and Alfred, Diamant completely flips on his head and claims that he has to lead for his people, which might include invading Furinae someday, because uh, clearly they are Brodia's greatest threat. Once again, the dialogue you see is exactly what you get in this game. It's not as though it was implied he was lying to Fram and being idealistic because she's young and then addressed a fellow leader more realistically. It's because the writers don't quite know if they want to pretend their world is realistic and fleshed out or just want it to be a relevant backdrop that's expounded upon when necessary. Nor do they know if they want their characters to be one-sidedly idealistic and good or pretend they're nuanced without any world or purpose to be nuanced around. Many of the issues with with Engage's characters are a result of the majority of them having no real role or stakes in the main story, because the unpointed message leaves them nothing to have stakes in. So they have nothing to address, commentate on, or disagree about, and no story to give in which their ideals eventually overlap or conflict with Alir's, and what is meant to be the moral of the story. If they did have these things, it might also solidify what it is they actually believe and don't actually believe, ultimately aiding the conclusion we're supposed to come to at the end of the game. Precisely because there is no real purpose, everything else down to simple character traits is left similarly confused. There is so much more I could talk about, but if I communicated myself correctly earlier when discussing the finer details along the lines of world building and consistency, it'll hopefully address itself. I don't want to be redundant in trying to talk about smaller parts of what are very overarching issues, so instead I'll be very broad with my suggestions. First of all, the name of the game. Make the emblems more relevant throughout the game so that they don't have to randomly butt into a conflict that, on an emotional level, had nothing to do with them. Instead, sort their appearances based on their relevance to the characters at hand, have them frequently talk to those characters in the story, and that'll be good enough. A good example I can give was one they almost had but never did anything with, which was Byleth being the emblem of choice for Hortensia and Ivy's plot. The game acknowledges that they have the commonality of losing their fathers, so I think that would make him a good wall for Hortensia to bounce off of when she's going through it. Technically, this is also a spoiler like Sigurd's random death reveal, but I'd be more willing to look past it if it was for a greater purpose and not just something they decided to offhandedly tell me. Let whatever they talk about subtly build up to the resolution in Solm Palace with Ivy, as well as the finale that they will all be a part of. I know the game says emblems summoned by the fell dragon can't speak, but this never affects anything and wouldn't change anything if it was removed. In fact, it would improve many things. Things. They're also more like mentor figures this way, acknowledging that they've already been through and developed around their own journeys. There's Diamant and Roy, who share the plight of leading at a young age on their father's behalf. Ivy and Corin could talk about the struggle to choose between one's family and what they believe is right. Vale and Micaiah have the commonality of rare blood that isolates and endangers them, as well as their shared love of their sibling. If this trend is continued among all the emblems, then when they appear at the end, you are now reminded more of what they've done throughout Engage's story as characters related to the theme, rather than being given something that they're supposed to represent at the last minute, despite them never having done anything. Not to mention the fact that they would then have their own arcs and purposes in the story, not just for players who don't know who any of these motherfuckers are, but also to, you know, 
make the characters in the story characters in the story, as you typically do. Second, pick a theme and pray. I'll stick with the one about family because that's actually what they had in the bulk of their game, so it changes the least amount of things. The finale sort of entertains the idea of talking about it anyway. So let's look at the best and worst examples of important scenes that highlight this and engage for the widest array of examples, then try to work what is below up to the top. Starting off positive, what I consider to be the best scene in the game is predictably the conflict with Hortensia in Solm Palace. Not only did it elevate her to most logical, thought-inducing character, but Ivy got to tag along for the ride. Hortensia's role feels very natural when compared to a character like... Vale, let's say. Vale inorganically appears at random intervals just to remind the player she exists, only to become arguably the most important character in the story later, and it creates a shaky foundation at best between her and Alir, which isn't established in anything important and understates what it will later become. So it both effectively makes Vale into a plot device and frames Alir like he's being dramatic. Hortensia, on the other hand, appears as a villain with a very straightforward reason for being there. A villain with which I actively disliked at first, just so you know I'm being unbiased here, and her actions immediately start consistently affecting the story and introducing ideas. Also, I think it's nice that she's the first character to already know and just get out of the way the fact that Alir is the divine dragon and seemingly doesn't care all that much. Refreshing. You meet all of the people who are important to her arc and are witness to all of the events that will affect her relationship with Alir, Ivy, and the others instead of just being told the ideas. The game is also unafraid to cut away to her and what she's doing before her big moment so it feels like she actually exists and is consistently doing something even outside of the vicinity of Alir. The player is given a very clear idea of what she wants and how she would react to scenarios that she's going to be put in. She is then consistent with what the player knows about her until she starts getting supports. <laughs> All that being the case, what do we learn about her in these moments? As the younger and less mature princess pampered by her kingdom, which is into some funny business, Hortensia is very devoted to supporting Illusia's agenda, but that isn't to say she's indoctrinated. Rather, she simply doesn't want to acknowledge what she doesn't actually agree with because her life is made better by being a figurehead of Illusia. She benefits both materialistically and emotionally. Underneath her outward spoiled brat personality, she's a girl who cares very deeply for her family and the life they had together. She is completely shattered by the concept that Ivy has left her and that her father has been killed. To Hortensia, status, but more importantly her family, is her very life, and she would give anything to return to when they could be just that, a family. Of course, Ivy feels the same way, but recognizes that living a lie wouldn't be enough to fix what their father has broken. She convinces Hortensia that together they can fix Hyacinth's mistakes and restore Lucia to something they can truly be proud of. Even even without their father. And it's, get ready for this, decent. It's an emotional scene and one that, because it was properly established, the audience can fully understand without all these elements being slapped on screen at the last minute. Also, on a miscellaneous note, Hortensia and Ivy's voice acting is really great here, and the music during the battle, both the desert battle theme as well as the Four Hounds theme, was the first and only time the soundtrack stood out to me. I do wish that Hortensia hadn't been randomly brainwashed in between all this, which was for the sake of making the player realize the already obvious twist with Veil, vale, because it confuses how much agency and emotion she's feeling in this moment, and also contradicts how Zephia's brainwashing works. But I can look past it because I imagine, even if she wasn't brainwashed, the scene in battle would play out the exact same. Unfortunately, this all completely overshadows Tamara in her own story arc, but I'm happier for it because Ivy and Hortensia, by virtue of being opposing forces at some point and having screen time before joining Alir, had their own expressed goals and important dialogue, which the story probably wouldn't have given Tamara anyway, if Alfred and Diamant are anything to go off of. I think it also helps that this was at the end of the longest stretch of the game starting to get better before it took another huge nosedive. It was salvaging itself into something recognizable with this prevailing family element, so I was ready to hear what they were going to conclude with. This scene is the closest we'll get to a climax of something that was actually established. As a result, both Hortensia and Ivy become two of the only characters that are not adversely affected by seeming disconnected from the story, because on multiple occasions they are connected, even if this arc will never be relevant again or have any greater meaning to apply to the rest of the story, the rest of the cast, or the finale. That being the case, let's apply these good elements to the rest of the story. Alir and Lumera. Whew. 
Calling back to the beginning of this video, the beginning of a story can make or break the rest of it, because it's the foundation that the story sits upon. It's arguably the most important part of a story. This is precisely why Lumera's death is the worst part of Engage. On an individual level, it's one of the worst scenes I've seen in any story at all. Considering the prevalence of family in Engage's main story, characters' scenarios will continue to call back to this moment, and because Alir is constantly comparing those scenarios to his own, those scenes are also brought down. Think Morian's death, Hyacinth's death. Some of the better parts of the story are dragged down by this, because it's the foundation that they continually fall back on. It means every time someone died, I sat in my chair saying, my mother died once, and every single time, Alir repeated after me. Not only that, but it gave the entire story the air of having family at the core of its messaging, only to turn it around at the last minute, leaving the initial drama purposeless. This can easily be resolved by giving Alir a relevant character arc. I'm not sure why this wasn't the foremost idea in the writer's brains instead of struggling to decide between making him Izuku Midoriya or Naruto, and then just making him a weird catastrophic blend of the two. This fear shit needs to go because it doesn't do anything both as a narrative device and also as a mechanical device that affects things. Nothing bad ever happens because of it, yada yada, we've been over this. It's not a character arc, it's an unconvincing way of pretending like he has laws. It can go. The protagonist and the events of a story they experience are meant to embody the theme of the story, whether it's a cautionary tale or they learn the message and the meaning of their journey alongside the audience. If we're going with a theme about the importance of family from the perspective of someone with no memories of a family of his own, then Alir should not be the know-it-all constantly educating people more adjusted than him on that subject, he should grow into it. Otherwise, you have what amounts to a Mary Sue with no conclusive reason for no or believing what he does, which was, according to the writers themselves, not the intent. So, I propose that Alir should not care about Lumera. He should instead grow to care about her. Going back to the sheer audacity to have Alir cry over the body of a dying woman for seven minutes after she basically just gave him a single history lesson and then died, the direction of this terrible beginning scene can also be fixed this way. The other three characters can cry for Lumera, but remember that Alir has no memories of anything. Anything. In fact, they have actively tried to establish prior to this that he feels the opposite of someone who is emotionally attached to her. I guess it could make him inherently upset that someone is dying in front of him, but as it stands, it's completely contradictory to Alir's own dialogue that he would ever actually cry, much less more than Vander or the two little kids in the room. Once again, what Alir does shows him being the opposite of what he at some point says he is. Okay, I have to sell this. I want you to imagine something for a second. So in this first scene, Alir would be watching, detached and from a distance, these three people mourning who is supposed to be his mother, but he doesn't truly feel anything for her because he doesn't have any of the experience that a mother and son actually would. He doesn't remember them. To Alir, this is just some weird lady. Alir does acknowledge this in game when he refuses the ring she tries to give him by saying, it would feel like taking a gift meant for someone else. Following that logic, it would be someone else that should be crying for Lumera in this moment. So you then follow Alir through the story, meeting endless amounts of people in tightly knit families who fight and die and grieve for each other, where each step of the way he learns more about what it truly means to be family, and why they're so important to each other. Even Vale is uplifted now, knowing she has some type of overarching thematic relevance in searching for her brother. I would have liked to see her join the player in some battles as a green unit, or even better, just be one of their units with the guise of journeying with them to find her brother until she's forced to leave when events take a turn. This concept gives Alir so many more interesting things to talk about with her, and with all of the characters, so a refocusing of our given time toward that would be ideal. He isn't this universal, all-good, all-knowing being that has never done anything wrong anymore. He's actively learning from the people around him, and subsequently giving them more valuable things to say. For example, Alfred's illness could be talked about more in depth, and from this, Alir would learn that he works so hard to train and stay healthy in order to be there for Celine and Ev. 
finding the strength to persist, even if it's difficult, for one's family and loved ones. From Diamant and Alchrist, he would learn what it feels like to lose the person who raised you, as well as the weight of having to succeed them. In Alchrist's case, as Diamant's protector, and in Diamant's more literal case, the ramifications of taking on all the burdens of his actions as king, as well as actually explaining what those burdens are. How one comes to terms with both the good and bad things their parent may have done, and still loving them regardless. Ivy and Hortensia's supports would be similar, only the focal point is more on reshaping a broken family in the wake of one component's bad decisions, as well as reconciling with Brodia and Illusia's perspective of what this would mean as the historical victim of Brodia. Generational trauma within their family symbolically represented by their nation. This is very directly related to Alir's relation with Sombron. Within these, I would have loved to see Ivy and Hortensia recount more of the good times they had with their father to account for the fact that the player only ever sees him do evil. These concepts may all sound familiar, but it's under the framework of Alir and these more expressed themes that they can become pointed and purposeful. Once the player reaches the final portion of the game and Alir finally figures out what family is to him, unconditional love by virtue of blood relation, he's given the information that he isn't actually Lumera's biological child, and now it would actually have reason to rattle him. He has to reconsider everything he's learned on his adventure. It isolates him from all of his close allies that are fighting for the sake of their families. This vital piece of information is no longer just some meaningless twist that's gotten over in speedrun world record time, it can actually impact him. I imagine characters like Panette, Pandreo, and Yunaka, who were all explicitly hurt or abandoned by their own blood, would have an interesting perspective to share with Alir in support conversations that would be unlocked after this reveal. The main story force that would actually have him overcome this, ironically, would be the Four Hounds. As I said earlier, I think Zephia and Gris's death scene could have potential. The concepts it touches on, how Zephia is so loyal to Sombron toward the end of bearing a child of her own that she doesn't realize she already had a family in the ever loyal Four Hounds, are solid, and if they served some grander purpose, it would be a memorable moment. Alir, Vale, and maybe Mavir can just watch Zephia have her realization about the family she already had while reuniting with the two components that she hurt and let slip out of her life, then come away from it contemplating what that means to them. Family isn't just blood. It's Zephia that Alir learns this integral lesson from. Notice how this, considering an expressed purpose in need of communicating to direct scenes towards, is elevating every other character, not just the protagonist it's represented in. So here's the big moment. Alir is face to face with the dying, corrupted Lumera he has just been forced to kill, and this time he has all the understanding he needs to mourn her. The scenes are no longer repeating as though that gives them meaning, one is subtly answering the other. It's subconsciously recounting to us everything that we and Alir have learned along this journey. In a sense, the answer to his question, what is family, was staring him right in the face as Lumera was dying the first time. It isn't blood, it's experience. It's the time spent in each other's company. That's why married people can call each other family. They aren't related by blood, but bound by the time they've spent together and the bond they've nurtured. In that way, the emblems, symbolic of the wedding band, become family in and of themselves. Because Alir didn't have those experiences, he didn't understand why the others were crying for Lumera. It was because in that moment, with all the time they spent with Lumera and all the memories they have of her, Clan, Fran, and Vander were more her family than he was. These characters could theoretically talk about this in more meaningful supports, or better yet, in the story, along with other characters that knew Lumera like Queen Eve and Alfred. It's sort of like a Breath of the Wild situation, where Alir unlocks more of these facts about his mother as he travels alongside the people that knew her. It's in these revised and hopefully very purposeful moments that he gains that experience, those memories that he needs to come to love Lumera. He has finally become that someone else throughout his journey that was set up in the beginning. With all of this at his back, he can face Sombron, face his quote-unquote father, with the knowledge that to him, it will always be Lumera who was the truest parent to him. Bro, isn't that kind of good? I don't know. <laughs> There's still so much more I could talk about, but I'm sure you follow. This is assuming the general contrivance issue has been dealt with and the world is made much more consistent, but I don't want to bloat this video more than I need to. Even just that one element really elevates so many characters, and I know if they were actually driven by a purpose to write the story, everything else around the characters would be elevated toward that end as well. That is the power of inspiration and a strong core theme. So it's bad. 
Generally, people seem to agree with this, although I think it's important to be able to explain exactly why it's so carelessly made beyond personal preferences before parroting that sentiment. The common phrasing you'll hear surrounding Engage is gameplay good, story bad, of which both claims often go unexplained. This isn't anyone's fault per se, I don't expect anyone to write an unprompted essay like this in the YouTube comment section, but I think this surface level interpretation understates a lot of the nuances that the reception of this game has, as well as the fracturing its cause. But why does it matter? This game is a game, and it's only meant to be enjoyed for its gameplay. If someone was looking for a story, they should just look for it somewhere else. Well, I'm sure you'd agree, then, that because of how bad and grating this story was, the game probably would have benefited from only being gameplay and having no story at all. You see how that doesn't work, I'm sure. <laughs> And it's because in Fire Emblem, and all games like it, the gameplay and artistic aspects, literary and visual arts, are conjoined at the hip. That being the case, why would it not hurt the game to have a bad story and benefit it to have a better one? One thing I'll say about Engage that surprised me was just how challenging it was. I think for most people this is a positive thing, but a little ways through the game I realized that worrying over dying characters I either didn't care about or actively loathed in a conflict that was meaningless to me was going to get old quicker than it would become fun. The more time I had to spend with them in battle, the more grueling it became and the more quickly I disliked them. I think my disconnect was actively what made the game difficult for me. Like I could do it just fine, it's just I wanted to kill myself. <laughs> So I promptly turned the difficulty down and had a much better time mucking around in fights. It actively made me like certain characters more when the game was incredibly easy and the characters very overpowered, because I didn't feel any responsibility or need to protect them. I like challenge, but the game has to earn it first. I pushed through Bloodborne and Sekiro and whatever else because they grabbed my attention and made me want to improve in order to succeed. When I needed to worry about the fourth meathead of the team dying for the seventh time, it felt more annoying than anything. I only didn't let them die because I thought it would be unfair not to give them a longer chance. But that then brings me back to the idea that it's the writer's responsibility to make the player want to see more of a character, not the player's job to devote extra time to watching their supports on YouTube to see if somehow, somewhere, there will be a single line of dialogue that just reframes and saves the entire experience. I think during the middle portion of the story, where my team became filled with characters that actually spoke in or about the story, as characters typically do, I would have had a better time with hard Mode. But then the game entered its final act and the main story was completely bloated with Allure and Veil and conflicts that had no foundation in the previous sections of the game that were actually beginning to go somewhere. I went straight back to my initial state of play and during the final battle my team had approximately three characters that I didn't know anything about and barely could remember the names of. Two of which were there because they covered something my team was missing or because they had yet to offend me in supports that I didn't have the time or motivation to get. One was only there because goddamn Diamant died in one of the more grueling maps that was putting me to sleep, and I just did not have the willpower to go back and save him, even though he was one of the handful of characters that I was actually okay with. I did feel bad about that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Diamant. He's, he's so fucking boring though. All of this considered, here's my question. Why is Engage's gameplay good? Please let me elaborate. This is anecdotal, so I'm not trying to make some declarative statement with it, but I did want to share that for players unable or unwilling to ignore the artistic half of the game, the gameplay was very negatively affected by the story and characters. The creators themselves claim they believe the charm of Fire Emblem is that players get attached to the characters, presumably because they know classic mode, supports, activities, even just regular old battles hinge on this attachment. Provided the gameplay and story of a game are one, the slog that is the story makes the gameplay grueling. Obviously I'm not gonna look at goddamn Tetris and say <laughs> no inherent artistic value, 5 out of 10. But in the case of games like Fire Emblem Engage, the characters and story are quite literally half of the experience. However, <laughs> Precisely because both elements are equally as important, that means that I won't let a poorly designed portion of gameplay or a great portion of gameplay go unacknowledged. Engage could have the greatest gameplay of all time. I had far from that same experience, but I acknowledge that this could very well be the case. But when half of your target audience does not want to play the gameplay, then it isn't good enough. 
It's not good enough to justify its other half to the people that care about it. The core of the defense of Engage's story that I hear often is the idea that by trying to achieve both a good story and good gameplay, intelligent systems would be flying too close to the sun. This concept is simultaneously upheld alongside the simple story claim, and reveals that blatant disrespect for and misunderstanding of the art form that is simplicity. Simplicity is unobtrusive and will not hurt the gameplay. Remember the simple, actively shorter but infinitely more meaningful Octopath pilot. Even better, remember overwhelmingly beloved games like Undertale. Striving for the best of all worlds can only elevate the experience for all players, and just because the maybe not so intelligent intelligent systems can't seem to do it doesn't mean it's impossible. If they cannot do this, it shouldn't be dismissed by low standards, it should be critiqued as an awful part of a game, especially when it's a massive selling point for said game. Otherwise, players will get something like Pokemon, where Game Freak can continue putting out underdeveloped titles and continue receiving money and accolades, because by virtue of having Pokemon in the title, all expectations are dissolved. They'll never strive for improvement because they know they'll just be patted on the back and told, you did the best you could. I know this might not immediately matter to those who were just happy to have what they found to be fun and exciting gameplay. We all experience a game's gameplay, and therefore it's difficult not to allow those experiences, both good and bad, to affect your final conclusion of the game. Even someone who first becomes invested in games by virtue of the art, can still discuss these elements on a level of having played through the same or at least very similar things. However, many will not weigh the artistic aspects as critically as the gameplay, despite the fact that, for a series like Fire Emblem, those aspects create the opportunity for that very gameplay to exist. This is, of course, a perfectly fine way to enjoy video games. It's the way they began, and admittedly their central draw. But when criticism by those who do value and dissect the art is disregarded by claiming the story is simple or that it would be flying too close to the sun, those aspects significance is judged by people who don't deem it very important. So if someone is the type of person who enjoys that turn your brain off sort of fun and enjoys rolling with the punches of a carelessly crafted story, I appreciate that enjoyment. It's usually pretty entertaining to watch train wrecks. At the moment we're living in a time where just about everything is being thrown together carelessly because people started to realize the entertainment alone is a form of release that can consumers will pay any price for. I understand enjoying that. The state of this industry is why so many of the best video game stories being told right now are indie titles, by new creators or by artists not on an extremely strict release schedule. They aren't merely obligated to make a story as a result of being a part of a franchise that needs to put out a new game, they were inspired to make it. Precisely because of this, I'm extremely passionate about encouraging people to take a deeper look into the meaning of the stories they consume and how it is you even go about doing that. If we applaud effortless and cheap storytelling simply because it managed to keep us busy for 60 hours, it'll become the standard and the overwhelming majority, because it is easy to write and easy to consume. Art is more than just a vehicle for selling something, be it gameplay, a waifu, or an escape from reality. It's introspection into ourselves and into the creator, as well as a lens through which we can see other perspectives. Maybe it's even a means to change the world. With that in mind, I believe that they, the writers of this game, can do, and that you, whoever you are watching this video, deserve better. My script says big thanky spankies. Um, so big thanky spankies. <laughs> The Fire Emblem community is like a newborn right now. It's very fragile, and I do understand why. Everyone is driven by a mad passion for this thing they love and what it ought to be. I do hope that we can always strive toward total improvement and not just continue to meander in this unsatisfying Pokemon-esque middle. I'm really ripping on Pokemon, damn. There still is and will always be the sentiment that uninspired train wreck stories can be enjoyable, and I don't want or intend to change that. But I do hope I was able to communicate that when the art founds all other aspects of a game, more thoughtful art can only improve the experience for everyone. In that respect, I hope even the biggest of engaged lovers can consider what I put together here as a sort of gentle call to attention. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. And look at that, I didn't talk about three houses once. Is it so hard? <laughs>